All right. Well, we're back in John chapter 11, but we're not going to be in John chapter 11 this morning. Uh, I, we will get there, but I, I believe that there was some uh, material I needed to share with you before we got there. As of last week, I wanted to share with you the number of resurrections that there were in the Bible. How many were there? Yes, no less than 10. That's right. How many in the Old Testament? Three. That's correct. There were three in the Old Testament, and there were numerous in the New Testament. The first one in the Old Testament was where? That's right. It was the woman uh, from Sidon. That, that Elijah had risen the woman's son from the dead, a Gentile woman, a Sidonian. Isn't that amazing? But not only did Elijah raise one from the dead, but when Elisha asked for the double portion of the mantle of Elijah, he did twice as many miracles as did Elijah. So how many resurrections did Elisha perform? Two, one alive and one when he was dead. When he was dead, yes. He performed the resurrection of the woman's son from Shunem, the Shunemite woman. Remember that? It is well. It is well with my soul, right? That's where that song really came from, I think, the inspiration of that song. But nonetheless, he rose that boy from the dead. And then, remember, there was an unnamed man who they were burying. And when they were burying him, uh, the Midianites were raiding the area of Israel. So in haste, they threw the man into where? into Elisha's tomb, and as soon as his body hit the tomb, whoop, he rose from the dead. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So those are the three miracles of resurrection performed in the Old Testament. What was the first resurrection in the New Testament? That's right. It was a woman's son from Nain. Exactly. So as Jesus was traveling with his disciples, there was this funeral procession taking place, and the Jews had to bury within 24 hours. So this, this boy had just previously deceased just a short time ago. And so as this procession was coming by, Jesus had great compassion upon the widow of Nain. Her husband had died, and now her son had died, and she was in such grief and mourning. And Jesus reached over and touched the boy, and he arose. Wow. The second miracle, the second resurrection Jesus performed? That's exactly right. It was Jairus' daughter, remember? He was the ruler of the synagogue where? Capernaum, that's right. See, you guys remember everything, don't you? So this was in Capernaum, right? And so as Jairus came to him and said, my daughter is lying ill, and Jesus said, well, take me to her. But as he was going, remember the woman with the issue of blood clung to the hem of his garment? All who believe in Jesus are Jesus' daughters. Jairus, I'm sure, was uh, quite irritated that this woman held up the master from coming to his house. But Jesus had to heal this daughter of his too. And then he went. But as they were going, remember the servants of Jairus said, don't bother the master any longer, your daughter is dead. And Jesus said, don't be troubled, she's not dead, merely sleeping. <laughs> And so he went and he raised her from the dead. And who, who was the physician that came to faith that day? Luke. Luke. <laughs> who was the physician, household physician of Jairus? Now, the, the third resurrection that Jesus performed is John chapter 11, Lazarus, which we're not going to cover this morning, but we will. Trust me. <laughs> but then there were many other resurrections in the Bible, remember? There was a multitude where? When Jesus was crucified, when he gave up the ghost, when he died that day, many of the graves in Jerusalem were opened, remember? And they were opened, and these people walked around for about 40 days because after he ascended, they were still there. Amazing. Can you imagine that? What was the other resurrection? Let's see. Peter performed a resurrection. Paul performed a resurrection, remember? And who did Peter resurrect from the dead? Dorcas. Tabitha. Remember what happened? The, the, all of the women of the area of Joppa, they put on what for Peter? A fashion show, right? Showing all the garments that Dorcas or Tabitha had made for the women. She was such a giving person. And so Jesus having compassion, I mean, uh, Peter having compassion, rose Dorcas, Tabitha, from the dead. And that last one recorded for us by Paul, where was that? The boy. What was his name? Eutychus, that's correct, Eutychus. Remember, he was listening to Paul preaching. And I, I want that opportunity. I want the opportunity one day to preach to you all night long. Anybody ready? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. We're going to have that one night. One night I'm going to come here. I'm just going to, we'll cover the whole book of Acts in one night. How about that? Huh? Would you like that? What? Christmas Eve. I did that in India one time. I was in India and I went through the whole book of Acts and I think I did it in three sessions. <laughs> and then they didn't want me to leave. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, all right, where are we now? Let me, I got to hurry because we, we got the children here. I said it was going to be a short service. Maybe. <laughs> 
Eutychus. Eutychus was listening to Paul preach all night long, and then, and then he got drowsy, he fell asleep, and out the window he went, and they said, he's dead, and Paul said, no, he's not dead, and Paul went down and raised him from the dead. Now, why did I report all of those multitude of resurrections, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Why? Why did I want to share that with you? So do you have every confidence of knowing that the gift of everlasting life that Jesus has given you is absolutely certain? Now, do most people live like it is? No, no, no. And, and this morning, I want to ask you, most of the church in Christendom, how do they determine whether God's really blessing their life or not? Health and wealth, financial. Finan health and wealth. Most, listen to me, most who profess his name, they're in pursuit of wealth. They're in pursuit of pleasure. They're in pursuit of living forever. Right? And they're, they're, they're more aligned with this world than they are the kingdom. Now, that's, that's, listen, that's not unusual. That's exactly the situation that was taking place in Israel during the time of Christ, when his earthly ministry began. The religious leaderships, they were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? What did we say the difference was? The Sadducees what? They were the materialists. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in hell. They didn't believe in life after death. That's why they were so sad, you see. This was all there was, right? The Pharisees, unlike the Sadducees, they believed that there is life after death. They believed in a heaven and a hell. That's why they were so fair, you see, right? But the problem was the majority of the sect of the Pharisees were living in pursuit of wealth, of health, of power. They really were not living as if they believed what they said they believed. Is that not true of most of the church today? I'm sorry to tell you it is. I've been a Christian for 41 years. I've been a pastor. Two weeks ago, it was my 30th year of pastoring this church. I began this church the 1st October of 1991, first Sunday of October, 1991. And just a couple weeks ago, it was my 30th year of God allowing me to do this. I'm thankful for that. But in my 41 years as a Christian, my 30 years as a pastor, it's been very evident to me that the well overwhelming majority of those who profess his name do not live to what they say they believe. In the text we're going to go to this morning, which is Luke chapter 16, Jesus is addressing the problem of the pursuit of wealth, of riches, of covetousness and envy, of not obeying the word of the Lord and, and no longer living truly for the Lord. And his measurement of that is the way in which they're handling their wealth, whatever degree that may be. Let me ask you again, what, what percentage of the church today tithe? That's the number. Listen to me, 2%. 98% of those who claim to be Christian do not live as if they believe what God says in the way in which they're handling their finances. They're in more pursuit of their own personal wealth and well-being than they are in giving to the kingdom. Now, now listen, listen, I'm, I'm not meaning to condemn anybody or step on anybody's toes. Right now, I want to touch your heart. It is no different in this fellowship, a little bit different. About 20% of this fellowship supports 90% of the budget. You hear me? 20% of this fellowship supports about 90% of the budget. That means if those, that 20% were to leave, 80% would no longer be able to continue this work. Now, I'm not trying to step on your toes, and I'm not trying to condemn you. What am I trying to do? And that's precisely what Jesus was trying to do to this group of Pharisees that he was speaking with. In John, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, turn with me there. In Malachi, when God wants to test his people to see where their heart really is, how does he test them? In the tithe. Make no mistake about that. As far as the Lord is concerned, he, he really can measure, and, this, and it's true. You can really determine where a person really is in the relationship with the Lord based upon how they spend their resources and their time. time. Their time. 
two most important commodities you have, time, time especially, and then your resources. What do you spend them on? And I've said so many times, so many times before, uh, you show me a person's day timer and their check register, and I'll tell you who their God is. Right? I'm not trying to condemn anybody. We all have to do an introspection. We all have to examine our own lives and see, am I really who I say I am? Am I really living to what I say I believe, or am I not? And that's what Jesus was referring to here. Now, if we look at chapter 16, keeping it in its context, Jesus is speaking in parables. Now, as we began chapter 10, I told you there were three parables that Jesus taught on the motif between the shepherd and the sheep. Why was he teaching in parables? Was that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. And why was it a bad thing? In Matthew chapter 13, it explains to us that Jesus began to teach them in parables because seeing they would not see, hearing they would not hear. Their hearts were hardened. So he sp spoke in parables, in riddles, because they refused to understand, they refused to accept. But, but to his own disciples, he was very explicit. He was detailed. He even gave the meaning of the parables. But he didn't do that for the multitude. And here again, he's speaking in parables. Now, we know who he's speaking to. His audience is the Pharisees. That's who he's really addressing. Look at chapter 16 for a minute. And if you look at verse 14, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. They stuck up their nose at him. Who is this beggar telling us? What was the... Uh, what was the situation with regard to Nicodemus' wealth? Yes, he was the third richest man in Jerusalem. I taught you that, didn't I? Well, Nicodemus, before he became a follower of Jesus Christ, was the third richest man in all of Jerusalem. The Pharisees were in pursuit of wealth. They had the ability and the opportunity to gather great degrees, great amounts of wealth for themselves through their positions and their power much like what's happened today. Everybody goes to Washington to do well, right? And they do well indeed. They all come out rich, don't they? Yeah. What happened to Nicodemus when he became a follower of Jesus? He lost everything. Did he lose anything? No, he gained everything. He knew that. He knew that. But, but this is who Jesus is speaking to. Look at verse 14. Now, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. They looked down their noses at him. What did they consider Jesus? An illegitimate child. An illegi uh, uh, hmm, yes, I won't use the word. An illegitimate child. <laughs> Foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What did Jesus have materially? Nothing. nothing. The clothes on his back, nothing. Jesus was a beggar, a pauper, homeless. And that's how they looked down upon him. Who are you, this beggar, this homeless man, this wretch of a human being? Now, Jesus begins to share with them this story. Now, we have a problem here in that we, we the church, have not really been able to discern whether is this truly a parable or is this truly an incident that took place that these men would have been aware of. Because unlike other parables, he doesn't start it the way he does in parabolic literature. And he also names three people where he never names names in a parable. Who are the three people he names? Yes, Lazarus, Abraham, and Moses. See, I don't know, you, you already covered the text, didn't you? Yeah, of course you did. Okay, but he names three names, which he never does in any other parables. So there are those who conjecture that this is a true story of an account of a man named Lazarus who died who sat before the rich man's gate continually. They threw him there, is what it says in the text. Tossed him at the gate of this mansion where he would beg the crumbs of bread that would fall from the rich man's table. They were aware of both of these folk. Surely the rich man, and to some degree the beggar. So Jesus recounts to them this story. Now, this is not only for their sake, although they would not receive the truth that Jesus was trying to bring to their heart. But you and I this morning should. In the scheme of things worldwide, do you know the majority of the world lives on how much a day? Two dollars. Think about that. The majority of the entire world lives on two dollars a day. 
Is that not hard for us to conceive? In the story, when we look at the world situation geopolitically, who would be the rich man? Surely we would. We're the most affluent society on the face of the earth, and, and our standard of living, although it is quickly <laughs> decreasing, our standard of living is higher than any other group of people that ever lived on the face of the earth. And who is it that begs the crumbs that fall from our table? The persecuted church, the church in the, in the Far East, the church in Russia, the church in China, the church that is so desperately in need. So may, may understand that as well. And, and that we, we need to have great compassion on those who are suffering. Hate Satan and what he has done. You know, I watched these videos I, I mentioned to you in the city of Philadelphia, Kensington Avenue. Do you know why I watched them? Why do you think I watched them? It gives me compassion for those desperately lost souls. And it makes me so appreciative of how my God has protected me and kept me. There, but for the grace of God, what? Any of us. Any of us. And we need to have compassion. Yes, yes so many people are suffering uh, their own bad choices and decisions. That's true. But it was Satan who hoodwinked them. Satan who lied to them. Hmm? On the prayer line the other day, Roger's not here this morning, on the prayer line the other night, uh, he mentioned that, uh, Lord, I am just so thankful that during the millennium and hereafter, we will never have a prayer of concern. We'll only be praising you. Think about that. That, that when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, that forever on, we will never have a prayer of concern. Ever. We'll just be praising him forever. Now we have so many concerns, don't we? You know, we can get lost in the concerns that we should be praying for. But nonetheless, it begins in verse 19 of chapter 16. There was a certain rich man. Doesn't even name him. He's just a certain rich man like any other rich man who's in pursuit of wealth, who's a self-made man, filled with himself. And what happened, you know, with the... As I've said so many times before, if, if you're demon oppressed, demonically oppressed, or if you're demonically possessed, can the church help you? Of course we can. We can. God has given us that power. I've had those opportunities and the privilege to pray for people who believe they were under demonic uh, oppression or possession. And God, through the person of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit, has given us power over that. But a person who is filled with themselves, what can the church do? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. And that's most of the rich. Think of the rich today. You know, in the 18th century, 19th century, even in the 20th century, most of the rich people, the elitists of the world, felt some responsibility to, to give to the poor and, and, and thanking God for their wealth. David Rockefeller was a devout Christian. Gave millions of dollars away to Christian ministries, to missionaries. Felt an obligation that God had given the ability to create this wealth and he had a responsibility to give it back. Is that the existence? Is that, is that true of today? Jeff Bezos? Bill Gates? Warren Buffett? Any of the powerful and the wealthy of today? Do they feel an obligation? A thanksgiving that God? No, not at all. They're like this rich man in this story. There was a certain rich man, and, and this is what is described here, he, was, he lived an opulent life. I mean, his, his wealth was beyond understanding. Have you ever been to the Biltmore? Anybody ever been to the Biltmore? Most of you have, right? When was that built? The Biltmore built? 1880. Now, most people, their transportation was either on foot or horseback, right? Carriage? Can you, can you imagine someone uh, bringing you over to the Biltmore to work in their garden or around the house and you go down the lane and all of a sudden you see this single family dwelling? What are you thinking? What a gross misuse of one's wealth. And it's interesting when you tour the Biltmore, they don't have a Christmas room downstairs. What do they have downstairs? A Halloween room. Now, we know for most people, Halloween is a fairly innocent event, but we don't participate, we don't acknowledge it, because it is quite macabre for some people, isn't it? Hmm. 
A certain rich man in pursuit of wealth and power. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared scrumptiously every day. Clothed in purple. What did that indicate? Now, it's not that he dressed this way just on a Sunday best. He, he was dressed quite extravagantly every day. And purple speaks of royalty. Remember how did the soldiers at the Praetorium mock Jesus? By putting a purple robe on him because he declared himself to be the king of Israel. And so they were mocking him. Purple, royalty, purple of wealth. There were two places where they could get a dye to dye their fabrics purple. Do you know where those two places were? One, I'm sorry? A merrick shell. It's a muscle that they would extract this dye from. It's very, very, very expensive. But the other place, Gail, you would probably enjoy that. It came from beets. <laughs> but, but that dye wouldn't last long. It would fade quickly. But the one that would come from the muscle, oh, it was a beautiful dye. And it, the clothes were rich looking and, and the color stayed. But it was very, very costly, very expensive. That's what this man was dressed in. Always, continually, dressed so nicely. It was a clothes hog. You know? <laughs> and fine linen. What was the fine linen? What did that speak of? The, the purple was his outward garment. What was the fine linen? His underwear. It wasn't Hanes. It wasn't Fruit of the Loom. You know what this boy was wearing? Weaved air. A-I-R. Weaved air. That's what they called it in Egypt. It was a very, very fine linen that was produced in Egypt. It was an Egyptian linen, and it was an undergarment, and it was like wearing nothing. It was, it was, it was so fine. It was like it weaved air. You could feel so comfortable in it. One ounce of this linen would cost you one ounce of gold. Can you imagine? One ounce of this fabric will cost you one ounce of gold in Jesus' day. Woven air. You wonder why somebody hasn't marketed that, right? Marketed that, right? Woven. <laughs> and this man fared every day. He ate out of a banquet. It was a, it was a party. Anybody ever see the movie The Great Gatsby? No? Who hasn't seen The Great Gatsby? You haven't seen The Great Gatsby? Oh, you've seen it. I said, who didn't see it? Okay, The Great Gatsby is a story about a man who's extremely wealthy. And he had this place along the seaside, and, and every single night he had a party. And everybody who was anybody came to his house, his mansion, for these parties every single night. And he was, I mean, he was a dapper man. Everybody would envy this man for his wealth his influence, and it was a party every single day, a banquet. And this is, this is exactly what's being described here, like the great Gatsby. He's the first man in our story. Verse 20. Then there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Lazarus was his Greek name. What was the Hebrew from which Lazarus is interpreted? That's right, Eleazar, Eleazar. And what does Eleazar mean? Exactly. God is my helper. His name is Lazarus, which is the Greek form of Eleazar, which means God is my helper. And this man, it says, now listen, there was a certain beggar. Oh, by the way, this word beggar in the, in the Greek text, protokos, protokos, protokos. Oh, beggar, filthy man, beggar, homeless beggar. Deplorable. Second Corinthians tells us, though he was rich, he became putkos, beggar, nothing, homeless, deplorable. Who was speaking of? Jesus. Though he became, though he was rich, he became poor. Listen, that's exactly why they were looking their noses down at him. He was in no different a state than was this Lazarus, except he was pretty healthy. Lazarus did not. Look at the text. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores. So not only was he in abject poverty materially, he wasn't well. He was a very unhealthy man. He had a number of physical ailments. Who sat and laid at, the, at his gate, and now this word who was laid, 
they threw him there. They would toss him there. What, what did the majority of the society think of this man, this beggar? Couldn't do for himself, probably can't walk. There's some crippled disease that he's having where they just threw him at the gate. They threw him at the entrance to this mansion and left him there to beg. Desiring to be fed with, with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Not only was he in abject poverty, but he was uh, suffering from malnutrition, food deprivation. He had nothing, nothing. He had to beg the garbage. Now, when we talk about the scraps that fall from the rich man's table, it doesn't mean that he was inside the mansion or even inside the grounds of the mansion where he was there to be able to take something that fell off the banquet table. They were throwing out their garbage, and that's where he was living. He was living next to the gate where they threw out their garbage. And he was trying to eat from the garbage. Who was he competing with? The dogs, the pigs, and everybody else who was scraping for the... I remember being in India and going to the dump. And it was so heartbreaking to see children going through the garbage and fighting the pigs and the rodents for the garbage. Lord, in 70 years, I've never been hungry. Look at me. I'm not, I don't know what it means to be hungry. This man, what a contrast between the great Gatsby and this homeless beggar. Nothing could be more extreme, could it? Oh, but wait, wait, we'll see. Desiring to be fed the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, what did the Jews think of dogs? They call, what did they call the Gentiles? Dogs. Barbars, dogs. They, the Jews have never had any regard for dogs. They saw dogs as a useless animal. Now, today, it's very different. Dogs are man's best. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah. <laughs> I love dogs. I don't know about you, but I do. But here, here, the dogs were licking the sores on this man where he could do nothing about it. And so it was, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. <laughs> now, this beggar died. You know where they would take the beggars and, and, and put their bodies who died in the streets? Gahana. What's Gahana? The dump. Gahana. Jesus described the Valley of Fofet, which is where they used to sacrifice the children uh, in the Old Testament, and it became the city garbage dump. And that's where they would dump the bodies of these beggars, these homeless people, these deplorables. I was in Addis Ababa. You know where Addis Ababa? It's the capital of Ethiopia. It's not Addis Ababa today, though, is it? What's it called today? Something different. Every morning, every morning, the civil government of the city would go and collect the bodies of the dead who died, most often AIDS and other afflictions. The missionaries I was with, they had to keep their own blood supply because you couldn't get a blood transfusion. If you went to the hospital and you were injured, you had to have your own blood supply. So the, the missions group there had their own blood supply. God forbid they should need it. But every morning, they would go through the streets where the beggars were, where the homeless were, and they would throw the bodies on the cart. This is the beggar. He died. Who cares? Who knows? So what? That was the attitude. Not as far as God is concerned, right? God, here in the story, and I think it's uh, um, just to beautify the story and present an artistic view of it, the angels came to greet him and bring him to Abraham's bosom. And so it was the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Wow. Now, this word buried here, if you look at it in the Greek text, it's a celebrated funeral rite. I mean, it was a, it, it was a celebration. The whole, everybody had to know. Everybody in town, everybody in the city knew that this rich man died, and he was laid probably in the state capital. Right? How many reprobates, wretched sinners, men absent of the person of Jesus Christ, have been so honored at their death? Come on. Many, many, many. But how many? Lazarus's, 
How many Antipas? Antipas in the message to the seven churches? The faithful martyr of Jesus? How many died and the world doesn't even take notice? But Jesus knows, doesn't he? Precious in the sight of the Lord is what? The death of every single saint. Every single saint. Precious. And so it was a beggar died and was carried by the angels, but he was, his body was cast into Gehenna, into the dump. But his spirit carried away to Abraham in Hades, Sheol, to be comforted. But the rich man died and he was buried and being in torment. Who was in torments? Torments where? God bless you, Leo. Hades. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Wow. So the rich man did die. He had a celebrated funeral. I mean, he lived in opulence his entire life. He dies, and now he's in Sheol or Hades, and he's in torment. He's burning up. What was Sheol or Hades at that time? In the creed, we say that Jesus descended into Hades, not to hell, not to the place of the eternal damned, but he, he went into Hades or Sheol in the Old Testament, right? S-H-E-O-L, Sheol, or Hades, H-A-D-E-S, one and the same, mankind's common grave. Everyone who died, believers, unbelievers, would go to Sheol or Hades. In Hades or Sheol, we're going to be described for us here, is there's a gulf, there's, there's two components, one for the righteous dead and one for the unrighteous. Smoking, non-smoking. <laughs> And so Lazarus is being comforted at Abraham's bosom, but the rich man is in torments. He's burning up. He's smoking hot. <laughs> Someone asked my position on cremation the other day. I said, well, the only reason I could possibly consent to that would be the first time in my life I have a smoking hot body. <laughs> all right, all right, you got a little humor, Okay. <laughs> It was, it was bad, wasn't it? Yeah, all right. <laughs> now, not only was he being tormented, and it was the greatest tormentor in hell, your conscience. So he was being tormented by his conscience. He was being tormented physically. He somehow could experience this physical torment of pain, but he was also tormented because as he looked across the gulf, he saw who in Abraham's bosom? What in the shield is this beggar doing there? And I'm not. Don't you know I must have been righteous? God made me wealthy. And then, listen, that's what they believe in. And listen, now some of you, if you don't have any knowledge of the word of faith movement, its doctrine, Please investigate it. It's, it's growing in prominence, prominence. It teaches that if you're really right with God, you're going to be healthy and you're going to be wealthy, which is exactly what the Pharisees believe, that Jesus is condemning right now. Lazarus being comforted in Abraham's bosom. What did that indicate? He was righteous. Yeah, we, we know he's righteous. That's why he's there. And, and there's two sections within Hades or Sheol, the unrighteous dead and the righteous dead. The unrighteous who did not believe the promises that God made throughout the Old Testament with regard to the person of the Messiah, they're in that place of torment. The righteous, there was, there was a, uh, a righteousness that you could receive on credit in the Old Testament. That, that just because you believe God, you believe the promises of God, therefore it was reckoned to you as Righteous, you're counted righteous. Now, now the actual reward for that righteousness wasn't received until Christ first died, descended into Hades, rose again, and then ascended up into heaven. And he emptied out that place for the righteous dead. It's gone. And there any longer. They be asked in the body today, present with the Lord immediately. Okay? But he's in torment. Not only is he being tormented by his conscience, not only is he being tormented of his soul and his, his, uh, physically in, in being burning up, and it feels like he's burning constantly. Some have, have described a life after death experiences where unbelievers feel the sensation of falling continually without ever coming. There's the fear of falling. Can you imagine that? 
And then the, 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 the torment that would take place, you know, just things I can't describe right now because of children. But Lazarus and Abraham's bosom. You ever see the picture of the Last Supper by Da Vinci? What, did, what does he describe? A long table, Jesus at the center, right? Is that, is that an accurate portrayal of the Last Supper? No. Well, of course not. Why? They sat at a triclinium. It was like a horseshoe, okay? Three tables. And the servants would come into that center of the horseshoe and serve from there. And Jesus and his disciples, were they sitting? No, they were reclining. Now, you always reclined on your left side. And you always ate with your right hand. They're trying to say the left hand. Left-handed people got it all wrong. I'm left-handed. But nonetheless, in that, you reclined on your left hand. You ate with your right. And, and describing the Last Supper that Jesus participated in, who was there to his immediate right that laid his head on his bosom? John, the beloved. So what, what's describing here? That Lazarus was being comforted in the bosom of Abraham. That man, that man fared scrumptiously every single day of his short life. And now he is in torments forever. Lazarus, however, is at the banquet there among the righteous. And he's actually sitting at the place of honor, leaning his head upon the breast of Father Abraham. The reward. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. What a contrast. Oh, yeah, in life you had everything you could ever want, but in death you are so impoverished, so suffering, so poor. But Lazarus, although poor in life, now in death, so rich beyond imagination. What would it gain a man if he, inherited, if he inherited the entire wealth of the world? What would it gain him? And lose his soul. Jesus said it's a bad trade-off. If you're living for wealth or financial security or the pleasures that this life has to offer you, you, you you're spiritually bankrupt. Now, there's nothing wrong with having wealth. The story isn't teaching that, that rich people go to hell, poor people go to heaven. That's not what it's teaching, right? No. Righteous people go to heaven, unrighteous people go to hell. You can, have, you can be a very wealthy man and be a very righteous man. Give me an example. Laterno. Who? Laterno. Oh, yeah. Laterno was, a heavy, uh, was an industrialist from the 19th century, made this huge earth moving equipment. And uh, I, I've been to some of the Christian camps he's, he's funded throughout the country, one in particular at Lake Canandaigua, New York. But he gave away 90% of his wealth, lived on 10%. But how about Abraham? How about Abraham? You know, Abraham was one of the wealthiest men in the world at that time. But was he righteous? Yes, of course he was. Now, you, you, listen, you can have nothing and be very greedy, be very covetous. You can be, you have nothing and, and love money, you see, which is the root of all. Evil. Yeah. All right, so what a contrast in life, what a contrast in death. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, Father Abraham, fa fa Father Abraham, what does that indicate? He's a Jew. He's a Jew and he considers Abraham his father. There's a lot of people today that consider Jesus Christ their Lord and he's not. A lot of people in the Lord's house and the Lord ain't in the house. They just say it is. You know what I'm talking about. Hear, O oh Lord, have I, what? Prepared a resting place. And, and Jesus doesn't want to be in a building. Jesus wants to be in our hearts. Amen. Many sanctuaries have come into this building this morning. If Christ is in your heart, you're the sanctuary of the Lord. Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Can you imagine such a thing? That he is in such torment. Listen to me. That that would satisfy him. He is in such torment 
such suffering, that would bring him some relief. You can't even imagine such a thing, can you? No. No. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. With, with this man, he's st- he, look, he still don't get it. His request to Father Abraham to have Lazarus come over and drop a drop of water on his tongue, how, who does he consider Lazarus? His servant, the beggar. He's nothing. And Abraham said, son, wow. So Abraham acknowledged that he's a, he's a son of Abraham in his ethnicity. He is not a son of Abraham by faith. Who are the sons of Abraham by faith? Daughters? We are. We are of the seed of Abraham by faith, like faith of Abraham. Was Abraham was a Jew? No, he was a Chaldean. Son, remember. Oh, boy. Now, that's going to be, listen, that's going to be a very painful thing for a lot of people when they pass from this life to the next, when they have to recall all of the evil and the unrighteousness that they did, the rejection of the witness of the Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ, wanting nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christianity. More, more, and, more and more in our society today in the United States, there are more irreligious people than ever before. There's such a hatred and a disdain for Christianity and for Jesus and for you Christians. Remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things and likewise, Lazarus, the evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from pass from there to us. Remember, I explained to you, Hades is a shield, two compartments, there's a gulf in between. We see that description all the time, right? As, as, as you see this bridge going across this fiery gulf, the Gahana, where, where few would enter therein, the, the place of the city of doom and the, and the city of, of paradise, the celestial city, the city of God. Simon, what was his name? Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel? Anybody? Simon and Garfunkel? What is it? Most, most popular song that, that he ever composed. Who composed that song? Paul Simon. Do you know the story behind the composition of that song, Bridge Over Troubled Waters? It just came upon him. Paul Simon, you know what ethnicity he is? He was a Jew. Our Garfunkel was a Jew. Paul Simon grew up going to synagogue. He, he grew up with an inclination towards God and the things of God. Now, I, I would not say he's a Christian, but, but God, the Holy Spirit, I believe, inspired him to write the two verses of that song that he originally wrote. He didn't know where it came from. He said, this is my best work, and I have no idea where I received it. He said, it was the easiest song I've ever composed. It, was just, it just came upon me, laying in my bed, and it just came upon me. Do you know the words of that song? Bridge over troubled waters? It's Jesus Christ. He don't get it. Amazing, amazing. This afternoon, just now the third verse, well, he was, he was, his producer had, and, uh, and Art Garfunkel forced Paul Simon to produce the third verse. The third verse wasn't the inspiration. The first two were. It's Jesus Christ. Amazing. How many people exposed the wonderful inspiration of God, yet they don't get it? Yes, you had your good things and he had his evil things, but now he's being comforted and you're being tormented. Besides this, there's, between us, there's this great gulf fixed. No one can pass. You got one opportunity, right? This life. I remember I was in an argument with a fellow, not an argument, but we were uh, uh, doing, trying to present an apologetic to this man who believed that you had opportunity for salvation after death. The Bible doesn't teach that. We'd like to believe that, wouldn't we? especially for those that we love who passed on before us whose lives were wretched, wouldn't we like to believe that there's an opportunity for, for everlasting life after death? But there isn't any. The Bible never gives you that opportunity, never gives you that comfort. It's over for you. But for Lazarus, who was dependent upon me every single day, although he was impoverished, malnourished, he was in ill health, but he depended upon me. He didn't curse me. 
He didn't curse the day he was born, but he would cry out to me. And I heard every one of his cries. I captured every one of his tears. And I sent my angels to bring him home to glory. Listen, bad things happen to us, good people, right? It's how you react to it. Are you going to curse God? Or are you going to say, I know that? All things work together for good. Somehow, some way, right? All things. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send, my, send him to my father's house. Again, he thinks that Lazarus is his servant. <laughs> send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Any of you familiar with the first-class system in the Citadel? No? You go down there, you're a knob. You're, you're less than nothing. <laughs> you walk in the gutter. My son, for some reason, wanted to go to the Citadel when we were up in New York. And I said, look, you stay home, I'll torture you every day. You don't need to go there. You want to be harassed? You want to be tortured? You stay here. I'm good at it. <laughs> It'll be cheaper, a lot cheaper. Well, after a few weeks into that first-class system, you know, and all those boys were writing home to their fathers, telling them, the boat. Father, warn my brothers of this place. <laughs> now, it's interesting that Lazarus is no longer crippled, was he? No. He said, he said warn him to go back. And, and at, least, at least the rich man had compassion on his brothers. He didn't want his brothers to end up in this place because they were in the same condition he was in, in love of money, in love of wealth, in pursuit of wealth and power, position. They must have been in politics, huh? You know what politics is, right? Two words, poly, many, ticks, blood-sucking creatures. That's what they are. Yeah. I have five brothers, and he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. These are the other two names that are mentioned, Moses and Abraham, as well as Lazarus. Hey, listen, they have the scriptures. They have the Old Testament. Verse 16 of chapter 16, for the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Well, they're trying to take it by force, trying to earn their way, push their way in. You can't do that. John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Testament. You understand that, right? And so what Jesus is saying here, he's recording for these Pharisees, listen, they've had Abraham, they've had Moses, you have the prophets, you have the law, you have John, and you won't believe. Faith comes by, and hearing by, not by miracles, not by the sensational, not by sensory experiences in so much of the contemporary church, when, you know, the, 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 the fog and the lights and the smells and it's all a sham. It's a facade. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now, previously, as Jesus was talking, and we keep this in its context, he, he condemns them for not even obeying the law that they do have. They won't believe who he is and all of the witness that has been given with regard to the person of Jesus Christ, yet, yet they still won't believe. But they're not even living to the law themselves. He references later on in the chapter, um, verse 18, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. He's, he's ridiculing them, condemning them because of precisely what they were doing. These Pharisees, they, they want to entertain a relationship with another woman, and so they divorce their wife for no reason at all. Did you burn my toast this morning? Snickers ate that burnt portion. <laughs> Something as simple as burning my toast, you're done. They would divorce them for, for frivolous reasons because, because they really desired another woman and then they would marry them and thinking they're keeping the law. And Jesus said, you have no understanding what treacherous hearts you have, how you are violating the law. 
Even if one would come back from the dead, they won't believe. Why? Because they don't believe the scriptures. They haven't opened up their heart and their life to the word of God, to Moses, to the prophets, to John himself, to what I've been trying to tell you, Jesus said. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Will they? No. But he said, Abraham said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. What's Lazarus' name mean? God is my helper. We see what's taking place in our world today. And it's, 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 it's distressing, isn't it? To see the corruption that exists in our country and, and, and evil people accumulating such power and wealth. I mean, we'll negotiate with the Taliban and we consider Trump supporters terrorists, domestic terrorists. How insane everything is, how upside down everything is. And, and listen to me, my father told me that prior to the return of Jesus Christ, things will wax worse and worse. And we think we can't, it can't get any worse. And then it gets worse and worse. But don't lose heart, beloved. Lazarus never lost heart. The beggar was tossed at the gate. The dogs would lick his sores. He was uh, malnutrition. His body was just eating itself. You know, that's what happens, you know, when, you, when you're not being fed well. Your body begins to consume the lesser organs internally to try to survive. Did you know that? That's why they look so emaciated. And then he sees this arrogant, unrighteous, wicked man prospering. But he doesn't become angry. He doesn't blame God. He continues to pray and stay dependent upon the Lord. Lord, Lord, I awoke this morning in peace. I laid down last night in peace, and I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the prosperity you brought into my life, Lord. But Lord, if I didn't have any of those things, Lord, I would still not be suffering loss because I have you, Lord. That was Lazarus' opinion. Is that yours? Even if one would come back from the dead, they won't believe. And next week when we get into John chapter 11, what does Jesus do? He raises Lazarus from the dead. And do they believe? They want to kill Jesus and Lazarus. How crazy. What's in this story for you and I? Listen, you have to ask yourself, what are you living for? Your own personal prosperity and peace? You're living for Jesus. We've all, listen, we've all been affected negatively by the affluence of the society we live in strongly materialistic society where, where almost 75% of our economy depends upon you buying, 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 buying. And so they always incite us through envy and greed. Ask God to change your heart. Make me a Lazarus, Lord. Lord, I was dead to the things I should have been alive to. Lord, make me alive to those things and dead to those things that you consider an abomination. For what man esteems, God abhors. God is my helper. Isn't it interesting that the Son of God would come in the same condition as this Lazarus? Potkos, a beggar, a deplorable, a nothing, yet esteemed forever and ever and ever. Amen? Mm -hmm. We have a closing song. Shall we stand? <clears throat>